Bocock, and welcome to Between the Covers. Meg Cabot is the wildly popular number one New York Times bestselling author of both adult contemporary and young adult fiction. You also know her as the author of the Princess Diaries series, which was adapted into two hit movies starring Anne Hathaway and Julie Andrews. She's written more than 80 books and she sold more than 25 million copies worldwide. Her latest series takes place on the fictional Little Ridge, a beautiful part of the Florida Keys that looks a whole lot like Key West. And maybe that's because that's where Meg Cabot calls home. The title of the new book is No Offense. And please welcome Meg Cabot. Hi, Meg. Hello, thanks so much for having me. I just wish we were doing this in person in Key West, but we'll save that for another time, okay? Absolutely. Thank you. I agree. This book, no offense, is a romance slash mystery. It's a standalone book. It is in the Little Bridge series of adult fiction, but you can read any of the books in any order. And if you could share some of the plot with us as much as you're comfortable with. Sure, yeah. So um, the book is actually about a librarian in a little library in Little Bridge Island. She's a children's librarian and she comes to work one day and she finds an abandoned baby in the children's section bathroom. And so of course she calls 911 and a handsome sheriff comes to investigate. And uh, this librarian, kind of like maybe all of us right now during this trying time has been watching a lot of um, mystery shows and listening to a lot of true crime podcasts. And so she has a lot of feelings that maybe she could solve this crime too. So she kind of challenges the sheriff about the way that he decides to investigate the crime and they kind of butt heads, but of course in the end, maybe they find romance. So that's basically the story. Meg, I'm going to tell the audience, the, the, the viewers now, if they have questions, they can drop it into the Facebook chat and hopefully we can we can get to, to quite a few of them. Would you, I'm going to put you on the spot, would you give us a taste of the book? Would you read a, a paragraph or so of No Offense? I would be happy to. And so I knew that you were going to ask me this and I was looking through the book all day today and we were kind of talking about this because we haven't, some of us haven't been to restaurants in so long. I decided to choose the section where the sheriff is actually going to his favorite cafe and he's ordering because some of us haven't gotten to do that in a long time. Um, so this cafe is also in book one. There's a book one called No Judgments and, and you're totally right. You don't have to have read either one of the beginning, the other book to know this one, but the Mermaid Cafe is also in book one. So Chapter two, John. Sheriff John Hartwall was having lunch at the Mermaid Cafe when the call came through. Specifically, he had been trying to decide between a harpooner, a half pound of grade A ground beef with bacon, grilled onions, and your choice of cheese, or a mermaid chopped salad. Obviously, the salad was the healthier option, but he wasn't entirely sure about the blue cheese and bacon. What he really wanted was the signature bone-in ribeye over at Island Steakhouse, but they weren't open for lunch. And besides, Dr. Alvarez had warned him that he needed to start eating cleaner. Dr. Alvarez, his weight was fine, but his cholesterol wasn't. And if it continued on this trajectory, the doctor had said, he'd soon have to go on medication. What John hadn't mentioned to the doctor was his suspicion that it wasn't his eating habits that were causing his cholesterol levels to go up, but stress like the recent spate of home burglaries over by the old high school. Not so unusual given that half the island's residents neglected to lock their doors at night or at any other time. Even his living situation was stressful. More stressful, in fact, than being the youngest sheriff in the history of Little Bridge or the bar fights he frequently had to break up over at Ron's place. John would happily take a drunken ball brawl over being a single parent to a teenage daughter any day. Hi, Sheriff, Bree Beckham the mermaid's most popular waitress, thanks to her bright pink hair and even brighter smile, came up to the counter to wait on him. What'll it be today, burger? John looked down at the menu and sighed. Who was he kidding? He was never gonna eat a salad, not even one with locally caught shrimp. 
Thank you, Meg, and thank you for putting in the Mermaid Cafe. I have to say, I, I, I was going to say I know Key West, but I know Key West as a tourist. And you live in Key West, and this is for people who have never been, there is no other place on earth like Key West. It is this eclectic paradise and a home to a lot of writers now. So does that give you inspiration? And did you know after you moved there that, yes, this is where I'm going to set a new series of books? Well, no, I didn't know that I was <laughs> going to be setting books there, but I did move here because when I actually came down on vacation, I just instantly felt so inspired. I love the people. They are just amazing. And in each one of these Little Bridge books, I have put a lot of true things that have actually happened to me. Um, I never did find a baby in a bathroom, but um, <laughs> the library here, I know the librarians and I know many of the authors who live here and some of the things that have happened to the sheriff, like for instance, this little spate of burglaries that he's investigating because people have left their doors open. That's actually happened here. And um, by the way, they, they do solve that crime. Um, so yeah, I've been inspired by a lot of the things that have happened in Key West and have put them into my books. So yeah, I would say that it's, the kind of place, I don't know what it is about Key West, but so many artists and writers are super inspired. Maybe it's the weather, but I really think it's the quirky, really kind people. Listen, it started, what, 50, 75 years ago with Hemingway. So it, it, it's the place to be, I think, if you're a writer. We're getting some questions, and I'm going to piggyback on them, about characters. Like, how do you make these characters so lovable? Do you base them on people? Are they modeled after people you know? And why don't we start with the main two, the librarian, Molly Montgomery, and the sheriff, John Hartwell. That's a really great question. I actually was on um, the street one night and I found a phone. Someone had lost their phone and I picked it up and someone was urgently calling it because their friend had lost their phone. And the person who was calling it was named Molly Montgomery. And she was a really good friend of the person who'd lost the phone. I, I picked, I was able to answer. And she said, oh my gosh, thank you so much. You know, can you meet? We actually met at the fire station and I was able to deliver Molly her friend's phone. And so that was such a great name. And I said, oh, I'm going to use that name in a book. My next book is going to be Molly Montgomery. So that's who Molly Montgomery, at least her name is based on. The librarian is actually a figment of my imagination, but I do love librarians because ever since I've become a writer, I've worked with so many librarians and at book signings and stuff, but also I really became a writer because of librarians. I mean, when I was a kid, I was a very reluctant reader and I, had such a hard time finding books that I wanted to read until my school librarian stir, kind of steered me towards really books about animals. I think it was like Black Beauty may have been one of my favorite books. I loved animal books. So that obviously Molly is a little bit of my tribute to, to librarians. And, you know, I have to say that um, the sheriff is pretty much 100% a tribute to, this is terrible to admit, he's a tribute to um, the sheriff from Stranger Things, the TV show. <laughs> Sometimes they're not really people that I know, but maybe people I admire from other people's television shows. I love it. There is this dynamic, this great story between the sheriff and his teenage daughter. And if you could tell this one part, because there is a mother-daughter dance routine, <laughs> only there isn't a mother in this household, so it's really a mother-daughter father. And you had to throw in a Beyonce routine for this very hunky man's man sheriff. And I <laughs> thought, where did that come from? Yeah, so in Key West, we do actually have a very great dance team. They're called the um, Conquettes, or our mascot at our at Key West High School are the conks, obviously, and the conks have the conquettes, who are the dance team, and I, I love that. I've, every year, somehow, I've managed to miss, they have a mother-daughter kind of alumni dance performance that they do at the end of the year, and it kind of always seems to coincide with another function that I go to, so I've always missed it, so I thought for this book, I'm just going to imagine what it would be like if I got to go, so I put it in the book, and 
the dance team for Little Bridge are obviously the Snapettes because the high school for Little Bridge is <laughs> their mascot is the Snappers after the fish. So poor um, John's daughter, she, her mother lives too far away. So because they're divorced, so she doesn't have a mother to dance. And she's kind of like, this is sexist. Why can't the dads dance? So she asks her father, who is the sheriff, if he will dance and the mother daughter alumni snap at dance performance. And he agrees because he wants to set a good example. And he agrees. Why shouldn't the fathers dance? So, yes, they do. They do a performance to uh, Beyonce's put a ring on it, I believe. It, that's not the name of the single ladies. And um, that's one of the reasons maybe that Molly kind of falls for him a little because she's like, yeah, this guy's got moves. He's and he's a great dad. He's a great dad with such a good vision in, in that chapter. Uh, we have a question that came in, and this is the second book. No Offense is the second book in the series. And somebody wants to know how many books will be in the Little Bridge series. Well, thank you for asking, because I am deep in the revision of the third book, which is called No Words. So we have no judgments, no offense, and no words, and no words will be out next uh, September. Well, September 2021. 20, and um, so far, that's that's all we've got. I, that's quite enough for me to handle right now. But no words is actually about a literary festival, a book festival that is being held on Little Bridge Island. Um, and a bunch of authors are coming to the island. Molly, the character from this book, is in charge of the book festival, so you get to see Molly again. And um, she's invited all these authors, but two of the authors really don't like each other, a male and a female author. And um, there's going to be some hijinks and possibly some romance if they ever get over their hatred for each other. We'll see. I think if it's a Meg Cabot book, there probably will be some romance. Meg, I want to just switch gears for a moment, if we can, and go back, because your journey is so interesting, and your journey before Princess Diaries. This was not an overnight success. If I remember correctly, I think you were living in New York, working maybe in a college um, at, at, at the time, and is that where you started the manuscript for Princess Diaries? That is, that's right. But you do some good research there. And yes, I was working at NYU and I was working in a college, one of the dorms at NYU and just trying to get published. And I was trying all sorts of different books, whatever, you know, I thought people might want to read. I was writing it and I was really fortunate because when you work at a dorm, the students are asleep a lot of the time it's because they're, you know, they're young and they're sleeping till like noon every day. So I had the whole morning free and my boss didn't care what I did. So I would just be writing and then um, sending manuscripts out and they were always getting rejected. Um, and the Princess Diaries came about because actually my mother started my father had passed away and my mother had started dating one of my teachers from back home. And I was really freaked out by it. Just, I mean, I was happy for them both because both of their spouses had passed away. And um, I, I thought it was great. But at the same time, there's that little part of you that's always a, a kid that's like, oh, no, my mom's kissing my teacher. Ah. So I started writing. That's how the Princess Diary starts is she's not a princess. When it begins, she's just a girl who's freaked out that her mom is kissing your teacher. And um, that turned into the Princess Diaries. And my agent loved it. And she started sending it out. But it got rejected everywhere. Nobody wanted to publish that book. But Disney, actually Whitney Houston, was one of the producers who first saw it because my agent thought it had a lot of good film qualities. And she latched onto it. And then Disney optioned it before it even found a publisher. So I was really, really lucky with that. So the life lesson here is patience and perseverance, and, and sometimes you did a little luck. I mean, what a great story. I always tell, um, you know, young writers who are starting out, you know, just because you get rejected, which I got rejected, I, I like to say I got rejected every day for like four years. I got a rejection in the mail, except for like Christmas when there was no mail, because I was back before the internet. So there, you didn't get like an email rejection. You physically got a rejection in the mail. If I had quit, I wouldn't be here. You know, after my first, I don't know, 200 rejections, I just kept at it because I really felt like, what what do I have to lose? This is something I really enjoy doing, so I'm just going to keep trying. And 
something my husband would always say at the time. He's like, well, I play golf and I'm not the best golfer, but if I quit just because people told me I wasn't the best, then I wouldn't get to do something I enjoy. So if you, there's something you enjoy and you, you like it. And even if people are telling you you're bad at it, keep doing it if you enjoy it. So. There is something about the Princess Diaries. And I mean, it has lasting power. And if I can just do a quick personal aside, when it came, when, when the books began, I was mentoring a, a young girl who came from a, a, a very tragic childhood. And we got these books and something hit, there was a spark in her. It gave her hope, it gave her confidence. Kind, you know, it, it was like being able to talk to a friend and, and, and see that there was a rainbow and that good things could happen. So personally, I want to thank you for that. And oh, thank, thank you for creating you. your own principality because yeah. that's kind of <laughs> cool too. <laughs> thank you. Well, I mean, they meant a lot to me too because I really, I don't know. I really felt like when I was a kid, I, I really felt like I was alone and that there was no one out there who was like me and felt as big as a freak as I felt. So I have heard that from so many kids that they, you know, a lot of the kids went and saw the movie first and then they picked up the book and I hear from so many kids, this is the first book that I ever read, you know, and it meant so much to me. And so that it, to hear something like that is the most amazing thing. So I thank you. That that's really great. Well, you are just a champion at capturing this teen girl psyche, the fear, the angst, the not belonging. And I, I don't know if this is it's because girls open up to you and, and they tell you their innermost thoughts or if you experienced it or remembered it, but boy, are you good at it. So thank you. <laughs> Thanks. Um, I don't know. <laughs> I think I think that I just, for some reason, well, I did keep a diary myself and I've saved all my diaries. So that's where I get a lot of my inspiration. So whenever I'm trying to think of what it was like to be a teenager, it's pretty easy to just go back and look at those diaries. A lot of it's very cringy and I have destroyed most of them, but I've saved a few of the less cringy ones to uh, continue working on in future novels. So if you could travel back in time and talk to your teenage self, what would you tell her? <laughs> oh my gosh. I would say, I think that I love the ad campaign of um, it gets better because I, I think that oh, it's so important for kids to hear that because I think so often they are just filled with despair and they think that things are going to be this terrible all the time. And especially now with the pandemic, I, I actually work with take stock that that's, Florida program for kids who are um, looking to go to college and it pays for kids who are, it's actually through the Florida uh, lottery program. So um, my take stock kid that I talk to every week, um, you know, this is, it's an amazing time for them to be going to school because this is how their school experiences. They're, they're going to school virtually through a pandemic and there's, it's so hard for them to think, oh my gosh, things are going to be normal again someday. We, and we just don't know. We uh, Hopefully it will. So I keep telling her, you know, it's going to get better. It really is. And I think that that's something I wish somebody had been able to tell me when I was kids. And I wasn't even going through a pandemic. I was just going through normal 80s, <laughs> 80s hairstyles and stuff. Um, so I think that that's something that's so important. That, you know, you're not alone. It's going to get better. Um, you know, just keep trying. And it's okay to fail. It really is. Um, it, it, the, the world is not going to just completely collapse if you flunk a class or even multiple classes. You are going to be okay. Because I did fail a lot of classes and I'm still okay. You managed to be okay. Here's what's brilliant, Meg. You had this, this loyal following, and you still do, of young adult readers. And then they grew up. And then they were following you into your adult book. So first of all, kudos, that is very clever. But now aren't the adults passing the young adult books that they read to their kids? Hopefully they're buying new ones. But um, <laughs> tell me, did as your audience grows up, your characters kind of grew up? That's true. Yes. I just, um, a couple of years ago, wrote an adult princess diaries. So we get to see princess Mia 
at her royal wedding and she's in her 20s and it was so funny i got so much mail from readers who were the same age who were going through their weddings they weren't royal weddings but they were still very happy to follow mia through her adventures as a young woman um a lot of them have got these great careers now they're teachers they are doctors they're engineers they're doing amazing things with their lives and it's so heartening to see that and um you know i just i love it because a lot of the teachers are buying the books for their students or their librarians buying the books for the kids that are coming into their libraries. So that's so gratifying to hear that. Um, and, and of course, a lot of them are buying the adult books for themselves and still going back for comfort reading, <laughs> reading <laughs> the books they read as kids. Um, when things are getting a little depressing, I found that there's a lot of people going back and reading the kids books. It's really funny. We have a viewer that asked a question, and I don't know how you're going to answer it, but she wanted or share, he wanted to know what was the your favorite book that you have written? Well, that yeah, that's a really hard question because I think um you really have to like the book that you're writing right now at the moment, or you'll never finish it. <laughs> <laughs> so even though I have really fond memories of a lot of the books I wrote in the past, if you don't love the book you're writing now, you just won't get it done. So I have to say right now, I'm just, I'm loving the book that I'm, even though I want to kill it many days, <laughs> I'm just loving the words. It will, she will be out in September. Um, but I, yeah, I guess that's, I have been to book signings for authors that I love and they get that question and, and they answer with a book and it's never the book that I like that they've written. So, I, and then I always get a little mad and I'm like, oh, why doesn't she like my favorite book? So I never, um, I never tell the truth. <laughs> I'm never like, well, I like blah, blah, because I'm like, oh, what if it's not that person's favorite book and I hurt their feelings? So I just, I just say, you know what? I love the book I'm writing now. There are a couple of mysteries in No Offense. And one of the mysteries is an abandoned baby that's found in a box in the library, which is unexpected and a, a sort of a very adult thing. Did you all, a, 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 in your brain, did you always go, oh, one day I want to write a book that starts out with an abandoned baby? I actually did, yeah. Because going back to when I was working in the dorm, that was a really big fear of mine that I was going to find an abandoned baby in the dorm. Um, just because that was something that was happening at that time. It was back in the 90s. And um, there, I lived in New York City, so there were people that were leaving baby and they were always fine but I was like oh gosh I hope I'm not the person who finds the baby and so that story was kind of always brewing in my head what would I do I had it all planned out like what I was going to do if I found the baby and um so that was a story that I kind of always wanted to tell about what would happen if I found the baby and so I finally got to so yeah I know it's weird we all have some people are afraid of heights <laughs> And I'm afraid of finding a baby. And so I got to be, this was very cathartic work for me. <laughs> that, I didn't expect that. I didn't realize that there was an actual fear there. So that that's interesting. And it was handled Great. so well in the Thank story. You. So everyone read it if you haven't read it yet. You, we said you're in Key West. You didn't grow up in Key West. You grew up in, in Indiana, in Bloomington, I believe it was. And you are too young, but there was a fabulous coming of age movie that was filmed in Bloomington. Um, was, do you know from, from you know, people telling you that this was like an amazing experience in, in your hometown? Are you talking about Breaking Away? The yes, movie? I am. I am not too young at all to remember that movie. I was actually there when they were filming it and my mother is in that movie. She is an extra who got paid to walk up and down the street. It was a huge event in our lives and we love that movie so we watch it all the time. And I've actually hung out with the screenwriter 
for that movie. So I got to find out a bunch of inside information about it. It was a really big day as an adult, not when I was a kid, <laughs> as an adult. So yeah, that is, everyone should watch that movie. It is It won for, I think, best screenplay um, the year that it came out. It is an amazing movie set in my hometown, starring my mom. No, she's, <laughs> she's not the star, <laughs> but she is in it. And a ton of my friends were in it. If you watch um, during the bicycle race scene, you can see all these kids and, and they were my friends. I did not go to that, to that filming that day because it was too hot. And I did not realize that I was missing my first chance at being in a movie. <laughs> So I stayed home and I think I read a book. I think I read Wrinkle in Time that day um, for the first time. So I, you know, I have no regrets. I would think that somehow you went to the Princess Diary movies and that made up for it. It, it did. It did. <laughs> well, this book, No Offense, is number two. Number three is coming out and... Who knows if there'll be more after that, but these are in the, the Little Bridge series. Meg, this has been such a delight. Thank you. Thank you. It was so fun. And I have to say, I'm a huge fan of the show. So it's such a thrill for me to be on here. I'm having the best time. The next book in the series is No Words. I'm Ann Bocock. Please connect with us and join me on the next Between the Covers. <laughs>